Hello and welcome to this presentation on the acceptability of wearables for atrial fibrillation screening. In this presentation, I'll present an interim analysis of the Safer Wearables study. This analysis was performed in preparation for a presentation at the 2024 Computing in Cardiology conference. It's thought that if atrial fibrillation was adequately treated in England, then this would result in 2,000 lives being saved per year, 7,000 strokes being prevented, and an additional 425,000 diagnoses being made. Wearables such as this smartwatch shown here may have a role to play in screening for atrial fibrillation, detecting unrecognised atrial fibrillation. To introduce myself, my name is Peter Charlton and I'm a biomedical engineering researcher based at the University of Cambridge. In the group that I'm a part of here, we are running a large trial called the SAFER trial using handheld ECG devices to screen for atrial fibrillation. And I myself am leading a much smaller study called the SAFER wearables study looking at the performance and acceptability of wearables for screen. In this presentation, I'll focus on three areas. Firstly, I'll give a little background to detecting atrial fibrillation in daily life. Secondly, I'll focus on our work so far on assessing the acceptability of wearables in older adults, the target population for screening. And thirdly, I'll briefly summarise our next steps. So firstly, some background. Wearables commonly use photoplephismography for heart rate monitoring. The photoplephismogram sensor consists of taking a cross section through the wrist, a light source, so a light emitting diode LED, which shines light onto the skin, and then a light sensor that measures the amount of light reflected back from the skin. And this varies over time. So each time the heart beats, the amount of blood in the tissue uh, increases and decreases, and this produces a pulse wave, here shown at a slower heart rate of 80 beats per minute. And finally, here shown during atrial fibrillation, where both the interbeat intervals and the pulse wave amplitudes vary from one beat to the next. Recently, wearables have also advanced to allow the user to record a short single lead ECG on demand. So here's a picture of me recording my ECG. One electrode is on the underside of the watch that's in contact with the wrist. And the other electrode on this device is this uh, rim, silver rim that I'm holding with my opposite hand. So this produces a single lead ECG, such as shown here, where each individual heartbeat is clearly visible from the R waves. And in addition, if we zoom in, you can even see features of each individual um, heartbeat, such as the P wave as well. And this is important because it's the irregularity in beat to beat intervals and the absence of P waves, which are used to diagnose AF. So with these two functionalities, being able to use photoplephismography to continuously monitor heart rhythm via the pulse wave, and then being able to prompt the user on recognition of an irregular pulse to record a single lead ECG, there's a promising use case of um, unobtrusively monitoring the heart rhythm in daily life using photoplephismography and then when an irregular pulse is detected, prompting the user to record an ECG, which could be used to make a diagnosis. With that background in mind, let's explore our work so far on assessing the acceptability of wearables in older adults. So the aim of this work was to identify factors influencing the acceptability of wearables in older adults. This was an initial analysis of data collected in the Safer Wearables study, 
where overall we're intending to recruit 130 older adults aged 65 and over, half of whom have atrial fibrillation. We're sending devices through the mail and providing instructions via an instruction leaflet and also a telephone call to explain how to use the devices. We're asking participants to wear three devices simultaneously for one week. And these are the three devices shown on the left. So firstly, uh, the pulse on arrhythmia monitor, which continuously monitors the PPG, vibrates four times per day to prompt the user to take an ECG. And in addition, keeps checking whether the pulse is irregular and if an irregular rhythm is identified, then it prompts the user to take an ECG then. That's shown at the top left of the screen. Then moving down to the middle, we have the pulse on optical heart rate tracker, which uses intermittent photoplethysmography to monitor heart rate. And then at the bottom, we have a reference device, an ECG chest patch, and we're using the Bitium Faris 180 device, which continuously records a single lead ECG from the chest. So we ask people to wear these three devices for one week and then to complete a questionnaire to provide their feedback on how they found wearing the devices. In addition, we collect informal feedback throughout the week via telephone calls. And at the time of performing this analysis, we had had 21 participants to complete the study to date. So this analysis is based on those 21. The results so far. Um, so we'd invited 75 potential participants in total. 42 had consented to take part, of which 21 had completed the study. Participants told us that uh, sometimes they removed devices prior to the end of the week. Five out of 21 removed the chest patch, the Faris 180, due to skin irritation. And four removed the wristband style pulse on device, which was often due to them noticing that the battery had run out before the end of the week. And then one removed the uh, pulse on arrhythmia device at the top left because uh, they'd been disturbed by nighttime vibrations. The headline is that most respondents said they would be happy to wear any of the devices for a week if they were regularly used to check people's health. So here in blue, you can see that almost all respondents to this questionnaire question either strongly agreed or agreed with this statement. However, when we look a bit more closely, we see that in particular, the chest electrodes on used with the chest patch were irritable in some participants. So eight participants, 38% reported irritation when we were informally discussing this on telephone calls. And this is reflected somewhat in the responses to this questionnaire question, where whilst some people uh, thought the chest electrodes didn't bother them, such as I forget that's there, and others said it looked as though they'd been attacked with an octopus with a round ring, for instance. So others strongly disagreed. We identified some other issues. So with the chest patch, sometimes the electrodes became detached. And often people said that the form factor wasn't suitable for women. And that's something we're trying to address. The pulse on arrhythmia device at the top left we identified these nighttime vibrations as a um, piece of feedback. And then the wristband style device, uh, people reported informally as well that the battery ran out. So this leads us to some possible strategies to improve acceptability. We could look at using different chest patch electrodes or locations. Um, so perhaps using different electrodes would reduce irritability and perhaps using different locations on the chest would ease the problem, particularly if it allowed participants to vary the location of the electrodes during the week. And we should also inform participants that accidental activation of the pulse on arrhythmia device can 
produce nighttime vibrations. So if you um, accidentally brush the device against your skin, um, then that will prompt it to vibrate to ask you to take an ECG. There are limitations to the study, uh, namely participants were only asked to wear devices for one week, so we don't know how acceptable they would be beyond that one week. And all three devices were worn simultaneously, so it's possible that the responses don't reflect how people would find wearing the devices if they were uh, worn in isolation. So next steps. Um, we intend to complete the safe wearable study, aiming for a target recruitment of 130 participants. Um, and that will allow us not only to assess the acceptability of these devices, but also their performance for detecting AF. In addition, we're also doing work on the reliability of AF diagnosis based on the single lead ECGs acquired from wrist-worn and handheld devices. So here, guidelines state that AF diagnosis should be made based on manual interpretation of ECGs. So a key step is uh, making that diagnosis manually. However, we've recently discovered in another study that when screening for AF using handheld ECG devices, in this case in SAFER, um, for every 100 participants diagnosed with AF by two cardiologists, those two di cardiologists may disagree on the diagnosis of a further 70 participants. We've published this finding in the article at the bottom of the slide here and we hope to look into this further. So with that, I'd like to thank my co-authors on this paper, um, the wider SAFER research team, the institutions and funders who have um, supported this work, and in particular, the British Heart Foundation, who fund my time in this study. And with that, I'd like to conclude that wearable devices were tolerated for one week by older adults. However, the chest patches electrodes caused skin irritation, leading to some participants removing it. There's much work to be done to optimise acceptability and performance and make wearables as reliable as a climbing rope. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and highlight that these slides are available online and much of the content is taken from the accompanying preprint of our conference paper which explains this in more depth. So if you'd like to find out more, do just search for the paper titled The Acceptability of Wearables for Atrial Population Screening, Interim Analysis of the Safer Wearable Study. Thank you.